Who was the other two nights, you know? Yeah, I deeply suspect there wasn't another two verses. No, which is, I mean, it was a fun, as I say, a whimsical song, you know? A bit of fun, you know? Like, it was sort of thing you would have heard in the 30s in Ireland. Burlesque. Burlesque, you know? It was actually more fun working out, you know, what... What might have been. What might have happened. What your man got up to at the end what of the day. What would you happen in the end, you know? And as I went home on Friday night, as drunk as drunk could be, I saw a head upon... Despite RT's ban, or perhaps because of it, the song entered the Irish charts, and with the help of this rather strange video, it served to establish the Dubliners' reputation outside Ireland. It opened up a whole audience in Holland, Germany, uh, the Nordic countries. So we ended up from then just touring Germany, Holland, uh, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and eventually went everywhere. This was the era of so-called swinging London. But Seven Drunken Nights entered the UK top ten, and the Dubliners even appeared on top of the pops, alongside more fashionable groups like the Beatles, the Rolling Stones and the Kinks. Can you remember the performance of Seven Drunken Nights on Top of the Pops? I remember particularly other bands who were on Top of the Pops at the time looking at us as though like four or five vagrants had <laughs> suddenly descended on the, on, the, on, the, on the studio, you know. That was an accurate description, <laughs> probably. <laughs> probably. Yeah. Did you get the same attention from the young mini-skirted ladies that the boys and the kinks might have gotten? No, I'm afraid not. No. No. We were What's too much in a rush to get out of the place to get to the, to the pub. And um, uh, no, wait, no, there was a lot of drinking went on, you know. You're all gargling your heads oh, off. Oh, gargling our heads off. And it was like a party that went on for about 20 years, you know. It all became very instinctive. Like, one knew who followed another and, and who joined in or who didn't join in. Luke, I must say, was incredibly generous. With, with songs and things. He would say to me, now you sing that song, you know. You know, a song that I would have thought that Luke would have wanted to sing himself, you know. He would say to me, now you sing that song. Or if he had too many that were going too well and I had a few that weren't going well, he'd say, sing this one, you know what I mean? Which I thought, you know, was very generous, you know. A very generous way of behaving. Ah, sweet bad luck to the waves washed to our island. The hooker of the Hammerfest Viking and Gold. From the start, there was a strong sense of mutual respect and generosity between the band's members, and they each had their moments in the spotlight. Jolton by Wellington's a monument. How notorious hippopotamus. When some bugger let down the backstop of the omnibus, and he caught his death a few years when he's rent in his rears, given six years. So there was there was a good brotherhood between them. There was actually, yeah, a, a, a good brotherhood. <laughs> Ronnie was just at the start of his career when he met the love of his life, a young woman called Deirdre McCartan. You remember when you first kissed her? I'm not going to tell you about that. <laughs> but you can, though. Oh, I could if I wanted to, but I'm not going to. You don't have to, but I'm glad to know that you can remember it. Oh, I can remember, yeah, yeah. They came from very different backgrounds, and it may have seemed like a match that could never work, but it did. I don't think I've come across any couple that were as in love with each other. They were hugely supportive of each other and, and, and very much in love right up until the end. Deirdre became part of a world that could be raucous and uncertain, but was never dull. There'd be many parties in the house. Oh God, yeah, and they gave yeah. great parties. Um, they really did. 
Over the years, Deirdre proved well able to cope with Ronnie's somewhat unconventional character. I think that was something that my mother loved about him as well, and that if he decided that he wanted to do something, you know, like if he wanted to go to New York and become a painter, I think she would have uh, supported him completely. For more than 40 years, she remained at Ronnie's side. And now, live from New York, Ed Sullivan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now, what could be more appropriate than for Sullivan from County Cork to open our St. Patrick's Day show with five bearded Irishmen from Dublin, Ronnie Drew? As the years progressed, the Dubliners traveled the world. The pressures of touring have broken many a good band, but it seemed to bring the Dubliners even closer together. We were like a family of brothers in a way, you know. The, the group became just more than a musical group. It was almost like an extended family in a way. I have in my bathroom a picture of the Dubliners signed to me. Um, and they just looked like the best rock and roll band ever. They kind of looked like the band or something. In the end, you know, to tell a great band, it's not just about the, the noise that they make, it's kind of how they stand together. Success brought the Dubliners to prestigious venues, such as London's Albert Hall. It was a location that would have daunted many musicians, but Barney McKenna wasn't easily impressed. We had to do sound checks and things, which we weren't used to, you know. And so we all went over to do sound check, but no sign of Barney. You see, we were all a bit nervous. So Barney eventually arrives, who uh, doesn't know how to spell nerves, you know. And as he's getting the microphone ready, he's looking into it and he starts to look up, you know. And he's looking up and up, and if you're in the Albert Hall, you just, you just seem to keep looking up. You know, it's so, like the so, Coliseum. so, so high, you see. But eventually, when he reaches it, he says straight into the microphone, my Jesus, the best opening you could ever have for a show. The place went mad. Oh, there was an old woman and she lived in the woods. Ronnie spent the best part of 30 years touring the world with the Dubliners. His career took him away from Dublin and his young family for many weeks at a time. Uh, if he had a, if felt any shortcomings as a father or as a husband, I'd say it probably came from a feeling of uh, having been away a lot, maybe in the early years, um, and uh, and also having had, you know, at times quite a uh, quite a lively social life. For all his touring, Ronnie took the responsibilities of his family very seriously. When he he would go away for sort of six to eight weeks at a time, but when he would come home, you know, he was very sort of full on. We brought up, we'd go off on drives and go out for family lunches on a Sunday and, you know, he, he, he was very involved when he was home, so there was no sense of not knowing him or him not being around. They're unique, they're absolutely crazy too. Will you welcome them? The Dubliners! The Dubliners became a sort of Led Zeppelin of Irish folk music, with a reputation for hard living on the road. Over 
Over the years, the group became associated with the conspicuous consumption of alcohol. He had some of the best times in his life through drink, and that he would never have had some of the experience that he'd had or met some of the people that he'd met had he not um, been, you know, been at the party for 35 years. Back from the day, oh, there's whiskey in the jitter. 